ברוכים הבאים, or I should say, I'm welcoming myself, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it is Rosh Chodesh, and the last I checked, Esperanza, in the Shulchan Aruch, it says that you are not allowed to eulogize somebody on Rosh Chodesh. So, Bezad uh, Hashem, I will tell you when I die, after 120 years, I'm going to add you to the list of people who should speak in my funeral, because you said some very incredible things about me. And maybe when I go to 120, they will all be true, Bezad Hashem, but really, I cannot thank you enough uh, for you, and for uh, Elias, and for the whole Bar Midrash of Ibn Sefarad and all those who are studying together are, are founded this initiative and participate in this initiative at the School of Mitzvot on the wonderful work that you are doing and the, the zechut is all mine, the honor is all mine to be here in this place uh, with you. If you don't have a source sheet for tonight, <clears throat> you are welcome to find it on our website if you write shiviti.org, S-H-I-V-I-T-I dot org forward slash Ibn Sefarad uh, you will find that uh, you can, there's a, if you scroll down, there'll be a PDF that you can click on. Uh, if there's somebody who's good with Zoom chats and you see new people coming in, if you don't mind just posting that link uh, in the chat box so they can access the source sheet while we read together, that would be incredible. Uh, I see some Talmidei Chachamim that I'm familiar with here in the group and I ask them permission to speak in front of them as well. But before we start, I want to tell you that... Uh, a long time ago, when I first was studying to be a rabbi and I came to San Diego, I never in my life thought that I would be a person who speaks about kashrut. You know, I mean, we studied kashrut in the yeshiva, we studied it in the Ben Midrash. Uh, There's definitely something we tested on to be a rabbi. You know, they make you learn very arbitrary things when you study to be a rabbi. Like, uh, you would think they would teach you things that are important, but instead you learn how to salt cows and what happens if chicken falls into the non-kasher uh, food, uh, all kinds of things like that. Nonetheless, when I came to the United States of America, and I, I don't know exactly the situation in Mexico, but I can imagine that it is quite similar. When I came to the United States, I realized that kashrut itself may not be the most important thing in the world. But the politics and the policies and the social norms that surround kashrut genuinely oppress and hurt people who belong to the Jewish community in all directions. It's the corruption that exists in the form of agencies and supervisions, some who maybe intend to do good work but unintentionally uh, cause some suffering at the hands of those who observe those rules and regulations and are no longer able to afford to purchase food at the prices they are able to... Um, it also goes in the other direction, and that is there are people who are part of communities, they're part of families. All of a sudden, we don't eat with each other, we don't drink with each other, we don't uh, have, do weddings with each other, Shabbatot, Pesach, Chagim, all of those things fall apart. And I realized very quickly that if we don't speak about kashrut enough, and if we don't properly educate ourselves, it's not about the kashrut that matters. It's about everything that comes along with this package, that is kashrut, that ultimately was intended to unite us, ends up separating us. And so with your permission, I'm going to be speaking the next couple of weeks about the laws of kashrut. But I want you to always keep in perspective and in mind that kashrut is the minor detail of a much larger conversation, which is what our Chachamim tell us in the Torah. It says that the commandments of HaKadosh Baruch Hu were given charut al haluchot. They were engraved on the tablets. And our Chachamim tell us, Al tikre charut and acherut. Don't read that word engraved. Read that word free. That a person who has the Torah is truly free. And one who does not have the Torah is not truly free. And I think that as we study together and we learn together, many people who have this experience that Torah suppresses our opinions, the Torah oppresses our lifestyle, the Torah keeps us very limited and restricted in a box. When they recognize that it's not the Torah that does that, it's ignorance of the Torah that does that. It is not halakha that limits our life. It is the ignorance of halakha while attempting to observe it that holds us hostage. We truly understand the wisdom of our Chachamim who taught us the Torah is that which frees us. But maybe, maybe before we go any further. Uh, Esperanza, how much time do I have tonight with you? I didn't even ask before I start. What time does Shul usually go to? Okay, Bezrat Hashem. We'll keep it under that, God willing. 
They tell a story about a guy who's making Aliyah from New York to Yerushalayim. He wants to move to Israel. All these years of his life, he's been dreaming to live in Israel. He finally does it, and they tell him that when he makes Aliyah, he's able to bring a certain number of electronic appliances with him to Israel, and they're not going to tax him for it. You know, you buy a car in Israel, you pay tax of 100% on the car. They tell him, this time you can bring your appliances, you don't have to worry about the, the taxes, you're an Ole Hadash, you're a newcomer, you get that for free. So, he comes to Israel, his plane lands in Megillion, a week later, his boxes come uh, from New York, they're in the port of Yafo, the inspector pulls him over and says, hey, hey, slow down. Uh, we said you're allowed to bring appliances. So I brought my appliances. He says, yeah, but why do you need seven refrigerators? He says, seven refrigerators? It's because I keep kosher. He says, so yid kasher, you need seven refrigerators? I never heard about this in my life. He said, let me explain. I have one refrigerator for basari, for meat. I have one refrigerator for chalavi, for milk. I have one refrigerator for parve, for neutral foods. The inspector says, okay, that's pretty extreme. I never heard of somebody so machmir uh, in my life, but okay, uh, there's still uh, three more refrigerators. He said, let me tell you. Also for Pesach, I have chalavi for Pesach. I have basari for Pesach. I have parve for Pesach. It's okay, that counts for six. You still have one more. What do you have another one for? He says, sir, what can I tell you? Sometimes every Jew has a yetzara. That's my refrigerator where I keep my non kasher food inside of when I travel the world and I go to people's houses and this one has a meat countertop, a chalavi countertop, they have a sink for meat, a sink for milk, they have an oven for fish, an oven for parve, they got all kinds of things going on. Soon I tell people that they should be scared because one day we're going to have separate smoke detectors in the kitchen. There's going to be one smoke detector for chalavi, one smoke detector for besari. You come to people's houses for Pesach and what do you see? It's like you walk into a spaceship, you know, like a movie, a UFOs. You come inside, it's aluminum foil on the counters, aluminum foil on the cabinets, aluminum foil on everywhere. Everything is covered, it's sparkling, it's shining. And it makes you wonder, is this the holiday of freedom that HaKadosh Baruch Hu told us about? Because when we read the Torah, He says we're going to celebrate the holiday of freedom. And then you look around and you see everything except for freedom. You see like the story of Hanukkah, is that the money, not the money, the story of Hanukkah, the oil that the Jews had, it lasts for eight days, it's supposed to last one night, it lasts for eight nights. I say the miracle of Pesach is the salary that you make in one month, it goes away before Pesach even starts. All of the expenses of Pesach and Kashrut, they destroy families. They just, I'm a rabbi Nakina. Every year, not for my community, Baruch Hashem, because we learn otherwise. I watch and I look and I help as much as I can. The people around me who are hardworking people, a husband and a wife, they both have jobs and careers, comes time for Pesach, they just, they can't afford it. They can't afford the everything has to change, the lifestyle has to change, the food has to change. And so today, before we go anywhere, the topic of today's shiur is called kashrut without labels. Nullifying the what-if mentality of modern kashrut. I was asked to give a shiur on how do I go to a store and buy things for Pesach that are not certified kasher de Pesach. And I thought that in order to do that, I would have to sit with you and study from now until next year Pesach. And the reason is very simple. There are many things that we have to learn together in order to reach that, that conclusion. We have to know the laws of kashrut, the laws of bishule goyim, the laws of cooking of non-Jews, the laws of yayin esech, of wine, the laws of food colorings and uh, insect colorings, and the laws of uh, gelatin, and the laws of meat and milk, and all kinds of halachot we have to learn. And I figured instead of teaching all of those details in a three-part series, which I can do, I want to focus instead on what we do know. Let's focus on what we do know. Let's understand perhaps the basis in the first place. Who says that the only things that we can eat are those that have kosher symbols on them? And I don't know what the Kashrut Mafia in Mexico was like, but if it's anything like the United States, I hope that the organization Ibn Sefarad will protect me when people start calling me in the middle of the night after I teach the Shi'u. And let's start where everything should start. Money. They say money makes the world go round. Everybody in the world needs money. That's a reality. Um, some people have more of it, some people have less of it, but everybody needs at least some of it. The bottom rule, and I'm a rabbi, so don't take my word for it. Money is not my strong point. But the bottom rule of any business, the common denominator that all businesses have, is I need to show you that my business is necessary. Because if my business is not necessary, then, then you don't need me at all. 
And so every business, doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter what you sell, doesn't matter how you work, sometimes the product is you. You have to show, I am indispensable. Without me, you have nothing. You know, I have uh, people come through my kila. I once spoke with an Israeli guy. He came through San Diego, and he sells garage doors. Doors for the garage. You open them, you close them. I said, can you do me a favor? Can you please explain to me why I should buy garage doors from you and not from the other guy? Wow, he went on a sales pitch. My garage doors, they open, they close, they have windows, the glass, is that. He knows everything. I said, why shouldn't I buy from him? Hey, his garage doors, they're good for you. You don't know what could happen after two years. They're going to fall apart. My garage doors, the screws. However, between you and me, they both get the garage doors from the same place. But it's about marketing. I have to make my business proprietary. If we understand that kashrut organizations serve a very important job, there are foods like meat and fish and chicken and cheese and who knows what else, wine, that we need Talmidei Chachamim, we need Jewish people to supervise them for us, then we are grateful to those organizations for providing those services. What is the mistake? The mistake is thinking that everything they tell us about their business is halakha. Because at the end of the day, I need to tell you why you need water bottles with my kashrut symbol on it. And you need to buy carrots with my kashrut symbol on it. And your orange juice has to have my symbol, and your milk has to have my symbol, and your bread has to have my symbol. And, and they'll tell you all the scary stories in the world. Do you know what they put inside of your food? In the tomato sauce, there are cockroaches, and the cranberry juice, there's insect coloring, and in the toothpaste, there are pigs. And they, Mama stories, if I spoke about UFOs, these are the authors of science fiction. They created an entire world in which you must be paralyzed because you should be terrified to eat anything that we didn't check at first. Now, I don't think that's wrong. So contrary to what many people think, I think that's common business practice. It's very important for a business to market itself well. The only person in the story who's wrong is the consumer of the food, is the one who believes the salesperson that everything the salesperson told me must be true. That already, that's already a deficiency in a person's intelligence. Instead, we have a Torah, Baruch Hashem. We have a Mishnah. We have a Talmud. We have a Rambam in the Mishnah Torah. We have a Shulchan Aruch, Sheh Bachra'en. We have all the books that we need in order to know what can I eat, what can I not eat, what can I do on Pesach, what can I not do on Pesach. No one has a monopoly on telling me what I can put in my mouth, what I cannot put in my mouth, as long as I am well versed in the realm of halakha. If I don't know halakhot, then I am always going to be dependent on someone else to teach it to me. If I don't know Torah, I will always be dependent on someone else to feed me my Torah. And I think that's the special thing about this group. I first heard of Ibn Sevarat when I spoke with Elias, but uh, Chacham, Professor Tzvi Zohar, after he finished with you in Mexico, uh, he came here to San Diego. I wasn't lucky to have him as long as you had him for. But we sat together for many days here in Maquila, for a whole Shabbat, a whole weekend. And he was singing your praises. But a young group of Jews who are dedicated to taking the learning of the Torah into their own hands to not allow other people to have a monopoly, to have control over their Torah. And when I heard that, it's, it felt, it resonated so deeply with what we do at Shiviti in the Bede Midrash, what we do with Kila Char Shamayim as the community, that a group of people will say, enough is enough, we want to learn Torah for ourselves. We love HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We love the Torah. We're not rebelling against HaKadosh Baruch Hu or the Torah. We simply know that our freedom comes through knowledge, that knowledge is power, that when we are educated, we're able to live a much more fulfilling Jewish life. And I will tell you that they say that nobody will ever educate you so that they, you can free them yourself from them. That's how most people work. I'll tell you everything you need to know, but still be dependent on me. Baruch Hashem, I have no uh, conflict of interest here. I don't want you to be dependent on me or on anyone else. And therefore, I'm hoping today to share with you a little bit of the education that will begin a journey of learning Torah, and I bless you all, everyone in this Bet Midash, and everyone who's part of this endeavor, and all the rabbis, and the scholars, and the teachers, and the, the, everyone who's involved in this platform. HaKadosh Baruch should bless them for allowing people like myself, people that you know, who have studied Torah together, to create a space of Limu Torah in Mexico and around the world. Without any further ado, I want to start with the source sheet, Bezat Hashem. If anybody has questions, uh, if it's crucial to understanding what I'm saying, you can always interrupt. I'm not, I'm not here on a lecture. You can always interrupt and ask. Uh, but due to the number of people, sometimes that can get complicated. I will stay here 
after the shiur, I'm two hours behind you. So once you're done and it's late for you, it's still going to be early for me. I will stay here for as long as you need to answer any questions or comments you have afterwards. So if it's crucial, please unmute and ask now. And if it's not, uh, please wait until the end and I will stick around for as long as you need me to. Pages one and two I added here because I was hoping that you would have time on your own to study a little bit. But I think that if I could summarize page one and two of my source sheet, is everything that I just told you. If a person does not know halakha, they will always be dependent on other people. And if I'm dependent on other people, I will never truly be free. And so instead of telling you about the importance of learning halakha, I figure let's skip to page three. And let's actually learn halakha together. Some of you may know some of these halakhot. Some of you may not know some of these halakhot. I'm certain that at least some of these halakhot will be eye-opening to you. And I think that should be the premise. When I go to the store, and I want to buy something for Pesach. And it says, 100% orange juice. What's the reason not to buy it for Pesach? So what do they tell me? They tell me there is bread in the machinery. They tell me that there is chamed. They tell me that there is pigs. They tell me there are unicorns. All kinds of things they tell me. But if I don't know what I'm looking for, if I don't know what halakha actually says, then I will never ever understand what it is that I can do and not do. And so I want to start with a little bit of an education. A few points of kashrut, of halakha, as it relates to kashrut. And to maybe think about, are all the things that we were told absolutely true? And if the things that we, weren't, or we were told, if they're not true, what does that say about my entire education when it relates to kashrut? I want to talk about the first point, And that is on page 3, source A, number 1. When I first got married, I took my wife... She's here, Rabbanit is here on the call. Uh, I took my wife to go meet my aunt, Doda Esther. The reason, I come from a Sephardic family. And Sephardic families, as powerful as men think they are, they don't make any decisions with that woman. And my aunt, Doda Esther, she's the matriarch of my family. Uh, and because my wife couldn't yet meet my mother, who was living in America, we were in Israel at the time, I said, I don't marry anybody that my aunt Esther does not approve of. And so we traveled all the way to Haifa to go meet my aunt Esther. And we come to her house. My wife, as you might know, comes from a family of Hasidim in Borough Park. My father-in-law today lives in Me'a Sha'arim. Uh, this is um, from the most moderate group of Jews that we have in the world right now. Uh, and we uh, come to eat in my Moroccan aunt's home. We come inside the house, and it's very obvious the first thing, that my aunt doesn't come from Bnei Brak. Let's just put it that way. And we come, we sit down, and at a certain point my wife turns to me and says, uh, Jonathan, listen, I trust you, but are you sure that we could eat the food? in Dona Estel's house? I said, I'm absolutely sure of one thing, that my Aunt Estel would never give me food to eat that I could not eat. Yeah, you might not think that she keeps Shabbat, you might not think that she dresses in a way that you think, but my aunt, when it comes to kashrut, and when it comes to me and my family, I trust her a thousand percent, that the food that she's going to give me is completely kashrut. Where do I get that feeling from? Why is it that it's not the attitude? They tell me that on Pesach, you should be very careful not to eat in other people's houses. Or maybe when you come to a new community, I once was in a community, the rabbi stood up after Arvit of Shabbat and he said, if any of the guests need a place to eat for Shabbat, please let me know. If you are staying at someone's home and you do not know if you can trust their kashrut, you are welcome to come over to me after tefillah and I will tell you if you can eat at their house or I will find you another house that you can eat at. I remember thinking to myself, these are guests there are Jewish people who are hosting them. They brought them to the Beda Knesset and the rabbi is announcing, don't trust everybody here to eat in their home. You should come and ask me if I can eat in your home. The Rambam, in the laws of Kashrut, in Mishneh Torah, source one, writes the following. This is an important halakha to know. A person who is hosted by another Jew, in any place, in any time, it's very important the rabbis of today educate everybody that halakha has changed. So halakha, is not, what it says in the book doesn't matter because everything changed. Uh, that's why it's important. The Rambam says in every place, in every time, it doesn't matter where. And the host brings you wine or meat or cheese or fish. Why does the Rambam choose those foods? You can unmute yourself. Why does the Rambam choose those foods? What's so special about them?
I'm sure somebody here has an idea. Don't be afraid. Well, this food has specific process of fresh roots. Exactly. Thank you. These are, it's not carrots and cucumbers and tomatoes. These are foods that are, I will call them, sensitive foods. They require particular uh, care to make sure that they are kasher. Very good. That was the right answer. Hareze mutar. These foods are permissible. So you go to someone's house, they bring you food, you're allowed to eat the food. And you don't have to ask any questions about the food. Even if you don't know this person, you've never met this person. You know that this person is Jewish, you can eat their food. So what do you have to ask when you go to a Jewish person's house? Absolutely nothing. When they bring you food, you eat the food. If you want to say, People like minhagim. They tell me, my minhag is not to eat rice on Pesach. My minhag is not to uh, mix, mix matzah with water. My minhag, my minhag is this one. Okay, My minhag is to follow the Rambam. When I go to Jewish people's houses, I trust their food. That's a minhag, it's a halakha. But it's my minhag. I'm also allowed to have minhagim. Now you're going to tell me, but there are Jewish people who they don't eat kasher food. So what, I go to their house and I eat their food? Very good, the Rambam continues. Vim huchzak she'eno kasher. And if it's certain that this person is not kasher, so meaning, it's not that we think, maybe they don't keep, no, it's we know for a fact, we know that they eat food that's not kasher. And they're not particular about these things. I once went to a community and they said, oh, this lady, she doesn't cover her hair, you can't eat the food in her house. And I think to myself, what does covering your hair have to do with kashrut of food? What was I afraid her hair is going to fall into the eggs and you're not going to eat it? What's going to happen to you? But it's a non normal. She keeps kasher? Yes. I don't care that Allah. If she's particular about these rules, the Ramam says, these rules, do you trust them? But let's say they're not particular. I know this family, they don't eat kasher. It's forbidden to go and eat there. But what happens if, anyways, you're in a situation? You were there. Then, you don't eat meat or wine until a kasher person comes and tells you this food is kasher. So what about the pasta or the salad? Or what about the tea and the coffee? What about the oatmeal, the cereal? I don't know what other people eat, the uh, eggs. What about that food? My friends, you keep kasher. You know how to make kasher food. You know what is a kasher egg. You know what is a salad. All of those things you can eat. The sensitive things, you have to make sure that it's kasher. The first rule of kashrut is that we trust each other. The whole purpose of these halachot is to create a Jewish society where Jewish people can trust each other, where Jewish people can eat together, where Jewish people can celebrate Chagim and Shabbatot together. Instead, kashrut has turned into something completely different. It is the number one thing that separates us from our relatives, from our family, from our friends. I see there's a question, please. But the Allah says that Asurli Tarek Islam, we can go even to consume uh, fruit. Or... Ah, you want to get stuck in Tarek Islam? That's a good question. It's a good question. Uh, my understanding here of this Allah, and I'm open to however you wish to understand it. You can't go into a situation where you're going to eat something that's not kashir. In this reality, you go to somebody's house. Imagine the averot that you have to violate by going to a Jewish person's house and ask them, is your food kasher? Can I eat your tomatoes? Can I eat your... A lot of averot happen to a person. It's not a good situation to put yourself into. But I would argue, aval, we already live in a world. We live in a reality where we are mitachim zetzezeh. We all go to our relatives' homes. We all go to our friends' homes. The step is to realize, so what can we eat and what can we not eat? Not can we eat or can we not eat. It's what can we eat. And if you want a better answer, uh, you can always take my email address uh, or my phone number and I'd be happy to discuss it with you uh, personally and then look into and give you a more uh, concrete answer than the one I just gave you. Thank you. Between meat and milk. So we hear a lot about waiting between meat and milk. I know this particular halakha is very contentious for some, especially for those who are adamant. Uh, uh, Maimonideans, they get very adamant about this halakha, but let's explain. When we eat meat, we're not supposed to eat milk together with meat. Let me work out some halakhot here. 
eating meat that was cooked together with milk. So for example, a burger that was grilled in a fire with cheese, and called a cheeseburger, I'm not allowed to eat this food. Yes, we'll all recognize. So don't walk away. You spoke to Rabbi Halevi. He said you can eat cheeseburgers. You cannot eat cheeseburgers. But which prohibition does somebody violate when they eat a cheeseburger together? Biblical, rabbinic, minhag, what are they violating? When you cook it together, yeah. that comes from the Torah. Very good. You cannot cook meat with milk. Thank you, Luzi. If you cook the meat and milk together, it's an isu da'oraita. It's a biblical prohibition. You cannot eat it. But what if I take cold meat and cold cheese? Let's give you an example. I don't know if they even make such discuss. Uh, but the, you take a salami and a piece of cheese and you put them together in bread, you eat it. Uh, is that a biblical prohibition or rabbinic prohibition? At worst, darabanan. It's a darabanan. At worst, thank you very much. It's a, darab, a rabbinic prohibition. That's assuming, by the way, that the cheese is kasher and the meat is kasher. Yes? Now, eating milk after meat is which kind of isu? It's not even, I know they will tell you rabbinic, it's not really even rabbinic. At the end of the day, you're allowed to eat meat and milk together if it's not cooked together. Our rabbis made a prohibition against that. And then they made another prohibition on top of that, not to eat them one after the next, so you don't come to eat them together, which really is a decree on top of a decree. It's a gezerah on top of a gezerah. So how long does somebody have to wait after eating meat until they eat milk? In the Talmud, our Chachamim tell us, one Chacham was famous for saying that I am vinegar, chometz, the son of wine, yain. Why? He said, my father used to wait 24 hours between eating meat and having milk. And I, I only wash my mouth out and I have milk. So how much time does a person have to wait between meat and milk? Clearly this was a matter of disagreement among the Chachamim. Some Chachamim, they ate meat and waited 24 hours. Some Chachamim, they ate meat, they washed their mouth out and right afterwards they had milk. Let's look what the Shulchan Aruch says. Source number two. Achal basar. If a person eats meat, even chicken. They should not eat dairy afterwards. Until you wait six hours. The Rama, the Rama is Ashkenazi, so the Ashkenazim follow the Rama. And he says, and some say, you don't have to wait six hours. That the only thing you have to do after you eat meat, you say Berkat Amazon, you wash your hands and your mouth perhaps, you rinse it out, and right away you can have Chalavi. Who? That's the Tosafot, the Mordechai, the Raviyah. If I were to tell you that almost all of Chachmei Ashkenaz, the medieval ones, used to eat meat, wash their hands, wash their mouth, and right away they had dairy. Okay, but what was the custom by the Ashkenazim? In these countries, the custom in the Ashkenazi countries is to wait one hour. One hour after meat or milk. And some say, that's really something else. And some are particular. Some wait six hours, like the Shulchan Aruch, and that's the right thing to do. But if I were to tell you yesterday, what did Ashkenazim used to do after eating meat? They would wash their hands and they would have milk. The strict ones, the custom, was one hour. And now the super Ashkenazim, they are keeping six hours like the Shulchan Aruch. But you see here that even basic halachot, like having to wait after eating meat till milk, in the Shulchan Aruch, they're not as black and white as you think and certain rules that exist in certain places, a person would be wise to educate themselves first in the halakha, and then afterwards to create a Judaism. But that's not the halakha that I came to tell you. Because I'm certain that you all knew that there are Jews who wait six hours, there are Jews who wait one hour, I'm sure you know that. But look at the next halakha. Everybody tells us we follow the Shulchan Aruch, we follow Shulchan Aruch, until we finally find something in the Shulchan Aruch that is exciting, it's a little more liberating, and it does, no, 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 by that we don't follow the Shulchan Aruch. So let's look at halakha number four. Achal tafshil shel basar. If you ate tafshil shel basar, 
a tafsir shal basar is food that meat was cooked in, but doesn't have any meat right now. An example, chicken soup. Yeah, you take a carrot from the chicken soup. Not the chicken, just the carrot. Or you drink the juice of the chicken soup, but without the pieces of chicken inside of it. Mutar lechol acharav tafshir shal gvina. You are allowed to eat afterwards food that was cooked with chalavi. So not the cheese, but the food that was cooked with the cheese. And you don't have to wash your hands. You could, but you don't have to. But if you want to eat cheese after drinking chicken soup with no chicken, or you want to eat meat itself, then you have to wash your hands. So let me explain to you the halakha very quickly here. If you eat the vegetables from the chicken soup, are you basari now? Kind of. Kind of. If you want to eat dairy, what do you have to do? Wash your hands. Wash your hands, and then you don't have to do anything. But if you don't eat with your hands, you with a fork and a knife, then you don't have to do anything. How many people do you know observe this halakha? That after they eat a potato from the chameen, they eat afterwards ice cream. Nobody. By the way, they all cheat on... Yeah? What? I know one for sure. A one for sure. One. one. Please, thank you, Chacham uh, Shimon. <laughs> I know they cheat on their taxes. I know they're very careful about pushing people in line. I know they sit in weddings with mechitzot until the heavens. I know all kinds of halachot that they invented. But, but I know when it comes to this, nobody cares what Shulchan Aruch said. Let's look at halacha number five. Halacha number five, and you'll bear with me because why am I talking about meat and milk in a class for Pesach? I'm trying to create a picture for you. Let me paint the picture for you. Halakha number five. Washing dishes. I just got a question now. From a person who moved into an apartment and they wanted to know if they could use the dishwasher in the apartment. They called the rabbi in the neighborhood and the rabbi told them they have to remove the dishwasher and put a new one because you cannot make a dishwasher kasher. Yeah? Now I have two theories. Uh, but my main theory is that the brother of the rabbi must sell dishwashers for a living. And that's why he tells people to replace the dishwasher with a new dishwasher. I have no other understanding why you would say someone has to replace a dishwasher. But you can imagine you move to an apartment. You're a student. You're going to be there for 10 months. You're going to buy a new dishwasher for the homeowner because of what? Because of what was inside before? Let's look at the Shulchan Aruch. That crazy book, the Shulchan Aruch. Maran writes in source number 5, shel basar, meat bowls. Which were washed in a milk pot. Why would you wash your bowls in a pot? Because yesterday we didn't have sinks. Yesterday we'd go to the river. You take some water in a pot. You would put it in the fire. And then you would wash your dishes inside of that pot. So you have a meat pot. You have to wash it anyways. Now you have dairy bowls. You have to wash them too. So you put them all together in the same pot. Bechamin shayad soledet behem. Afidu shenehem b'nei yoman mutar. If the bowls are dairy, and they were used in the last 24 hours, and they're dirty, and the pot was used in the last 24 hours, and it's dirty, and the water is burning hot, muta is allowed. Why? Because the halakha says the meat gives flavor to the water, the water to the milk. This is not a problem of halakha. But that's hu shiomar barili shlo hayashum shuman davuk bahen. That's only if you know that there's no fat. So not like I told you that it's dirty. But what if there is fat or stuck to them? So you have to make sure that there is one in 60 amount water to the utensils. But Maran says one more thing. It seems to me the halakha. If you put efer inside of the water, what is efer? That was a question. What is Efer? Soil. Say it again. Soil. I don't know that. Soil. Soap. Not, not soap. Efer is ashes. You know, like you burn something, the ashes. Ashes. Yes? Okay. You take those ashes, you put it in the water. Why would you put ashes in the water? To make the water not taste good. Yeah, it's called pogame. You are pogame the water. 
אם נתנו אפר במים חמים שביורק קודם שהניחו הגדרות בתוכה, if you put the ashes in the water before you put the dairy dishes, אף על פי שהשומן דבוק בהם, even though they're dirty and there's fat in there, מותר, it's permitted. דל ידי האפר הוא נותן טעם לפגם, because once you put ashes in the water, nobody's going to drink that water. That water becomes undrinkable, and undrinkable water is not a problem of kashrut. And because of that, if there is, imagine this, what's worse tasting? Ashes in water or soap in water? Which tastes worse? Soap. For sure the soap. For sure the soap. The soap that goes in the water means you can put meat and you can put milk and you can put whatever you want inside of that water because that water has no status of becoming something not kasher. It's from this, by the way, that Chacham Avodah Yosef in his uh, book, I think it would be Omer, he writes that you can put your dishwasher in meat dishes and milk dishes and detergent and close the door and wash them all together in boiling hot water. Why? Because the water has soap inside of it. It's not a problem of kashrut. Now why did I quote you Chacham Avodah Yosef? Because I wanted to quote you somebody who was alive recently. Because again, everybody will tell me, ah, that's a halakha in the time of the Shulchan Aruch, but now it's not the Shulchan Aruch, and now there's a new halakha. It's like the Christians. There's an Old Testament and a New Testament. You have Jews. They have an old Shulchan Aruch and they have a, it's a new Shulchan Aruch. Everything changes in the new world. Talk to me about your ovens. Your oven. You go to somebody's house. Have you ever been to somebody's house where they have a meat oven and a dairy oven? A besari oven and a chalev oven. You ever seen that before? I can imagine that your friends, they also put aluminum foil on their kitchen countertops. Yes. Let's talk to you about ovens for just one minute. Maran of the Shulchan Aruch tells us the status of ovens. He writes, En solin basar kishera. You do not take kasher meat and barbecue, you know, in a grill, in a barbecue, in basar nevela, with non-kasher meat, or shel behema temea, or a non-kasher animal, betanur echad. So you don't take the meat and roast it in the in the in the grill in the fire with one kasher meat and non-kasher meat. Even though they don't touch each other. But what happens if in the same barbecue there's a kasher steak and a non-kasher steak and they don't touch each other? But they're in the same barbecue. What's the status of the kasher steak? Says Maran, you're allowed to eat the steak. Mutar. And that's is even if the non-kasher steak was very fatty and the one that is kasher is lean. And don't worry, probably, my friends, if you're buying kasher meat and non-kasher meat, the non-kasher meat is probably better than the quality of the kasher meat you bought. Anyway, so this situation the Maran is telling us about is probably accurate. The meat that was cooked together with a non-kasher meat, but it's dry, it's not in a pot together, it's on a barbecue, it's on a rack of the oven, this food is kasher. V'im ha-tanur gadol, and if the oven is big, shemachzik yud bet esroni, I have on my website, exact measurement, what is 12 esronim, upiv patuach, and the mouth of the oven is open, mutar litzlotam bo, you can even intentionally put them together there. Uvivad shalai guza bazeh, just make sure the steaks don't touch each other. Says Maran, but if you're going to cover one of them, so you're going to put the kasher meat in a pan that's closed, or you're going to put the non-kasher meat in a pan that's closed, and you're going to put it in the oven together, even if it's completely sealed, the oven, and there's no ventilation, then it's a very small oven, the kasher meat is still kasher. Says Maran, What am I talking about? When you have to cover them. When you're roasting them dry. But if you're coming to cook them in a pot separately, even a small oven, and it's completely sealed. You know what a, a completely sealed oven is like? The oven in your house, it's not completely sealed. You know how you know? You ever stand too close to the oven and the hot air burns you? There's fans, there's vents, all kinds of things. When I'm talking about oven that's sealed, maybe you from Mexico will understand better than the Americans will understand. You ever heard of a barbacoa before? 
you dig a hole in the ground and you put inside of it meat and then you close it. That's what Maran is talking about. It's completely closed. There's no ventilation. Maran says in that situation, but they're separate. Mutar, it's allowed Even though they're uncovered, you're allowed to cook them together. So no backup for me. There's no such thing as a kasher oven and a non-kasher oven. So how could there be a chalavi oven and a basari oven? How could there be a chametz oven and a kasher le pesach oven? Just like there is no kasher and non-kasher dishwasher because there's soap inside of it, there is no such thing as a kasher or a non-kasher oven, at least in the reality that I'm familiar with, when you're cooking it in the way that Maran Hashukh Anahu spoke about. So, so far, we're crossing things off of our list. Ovens, dishwashers, when they tell you you cannot buy food because you don't know where it was cooked, maybe while they were cooking the food, there was something non-kasher there. But if you know halachot, you stop to worry about all the what if, what if, what if, because even if, it doesn't actually matter. It has no practical ramification to the kashrut of the food that I'm going to eat. Vinegar. Now vinegar for Pesach could be a problem. Why? Because vinegar can come from chametz sources. Yes? Especially white vinegar. White vinegar can come from chametz. Uh, but let's say apple cider vinegar, rice vinegar, potato vinegar, corn vinegar, all of those vinegars for Sfaradim, for sure they're okay. For Ashkenazim, it's a good question how far you take the custom of Kitniot. That's going to be our third class together. But when it comes to vinegar, they tell you, if it says vinegar in the ingredients, you can't eat it because you don't know. Maybe the vinegar comes from wine. Maybe the vinegar... Is... Has anyone here ever purchased before a balsamic vinegar or red wine vinegar? Yeah, you bought it before? Uh, and what about white vinegar? The simple white vinegar. Is there a price difference between white, white vinegar and balsamic vinegar? When you go to somebody's house and you see them cleaning the floor or the countertop with white vinegar or the bathroom with white vinegar. You ever seen someone use balsamic vinegar to clean the toilet with? What's the reason? Aside from it's disgusting to think about. What's the reason? It's very simple. White vinegar is so cheap. And wine vinegars are expensive. There's not something Maran didn't know about. So look what it says in Shulchan Aruch. Kol elu hamashkim v'chen achomet shechar asur liknoto mihem im demehem ikarim idme hayayin. You cannot purchase any alcohol or liquids from non-Jews if they are more expensive than wine. So imagine a world in which white vinegar was more expensive than balsamic vinegar, or white wine vinegar is more realistic. Then I cannot buy white wine vinegar. Uh, I cannot buy white vinegar from Goyim because maybe they'll put wine vinegar inside of my wine. But if the wine vinegar is more expensive than regular vinegar, then of course you could buy it from them. What does a non-Jew get out of tricking you by losing more money for himself? Absolutely nothing. Says Maran, so if that's the case, if the things like wine are more expensive than the regular vinegar, then of course you can go buy vinegar from them. Ah, but what about the utensils, the kelim? They tell me maybe there were things there that were not kasher. Maybe the, the barrel they kept the vinegar in used to be used for something non-kasher. I'm sure you've heard this before. So I don't want to quote you, Shulchan You know why? Because Maran didn't even think of such a ridiculous question. But who did? The Ashkenazim had this question. What happens if the barrel has something not kasher So the Ramah writes something that I'm sure if you show it to an Ashkenazi rabbi, he wouldn't know what to do with this information. So here's what the Ramah writes. I should be careful what I say, because I'm afraid next class you're not going to invite me. I have to be careful who I speak about. Uh, but right now, source number eight. Look what the Ramah says. V'afal pi sheregilim limshoach hayorot v'akelim b'shuman chazir. Even though where we live, in Ashkenaz, they usually smear all of the pots and the pans and the barrels with the fat of pigs. Shuman chazir, it's the fat of pigs. And Lachosh, you don't have to worry about that from a Kashrut perspective. They have a nitina tam gum. Because nobody wants vinegar, uh, pork flavored vinegar. Nobody wants that. Ham flavored orange juice. And nobody wants to eat this kind of thing. And therefore, it's pagum. Just the fact that the pig is in the food and you don't want it is pagum. Gum, batel b'shishim. 
It's also nullified in 60. Think about the barrel and how much wine or vinegar the barrel holds. It doesn't matter that it's there. It's nullified in 60. And so the Ramah tells you, who cares what's on the machinery in the factory? If that thing that's on the machinery in the factory is pig, it doesn't give a good flavor to my food. And therefore, the chatechila, ideally, you're allowed to buy your vinegar from barrels that are smeared with pig fat. And there's not a problem of kashrut. So again, I told you, I'm not going to teach you all of your kashrut in one, 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 one minute. But I want to slowly tell you that the things that we've heard, all of us, myself too, as a child, as a young adult, when it comes to the utensils, the equipment, they tell you what if, what if there were pigs, what if there were pigs, what if there were pigs? Very simple question. When I go to buy honey for Pesach, when I go to buy oil for Pesach, when I go to buy... The fact that there were things in there beforehand, what does it bother me? It doesn't bother the kashrut status of the food. So maybe it bothers you on an emotional level. Okay, Bo Hashem. My wife is a social worker. I know some good therapists. You go to a lot of places for things that bother you emotionally. But when it comes to halakha, you can't create problems if they're not really problems. Talking about honey and oil, look in source number nine in the Shulchan Aruch. They tell me you have to be careful. Somebody asked me now, are tortilla chips, are they kasher? I said, what are the ingredients of the chips? It says corn, Salt and oil. Now, Baruch Hashem, if everybody's food was that simple, today you look at tortilla chips, it's like Megillat Esther on the back of the tortilla chips. There's like 3,000 words over there, and you don't even know what half of those things are. Chances are you shouldn't eat those tortilla chips, but nothing to do with kashrut. Yes, this tortilla, it's tortilla, it's corn, it's salt and oil. What's here? Ah, oh, the oil. You can buy oil from non-Jews. That's what they tell us. Because who knows, maybe it's pig oil, maybe... Okay, for a moment, I'm going to ask you, if you go now to the grocery store, not to the cashier grocery store, just to the regular grocery store, the type of oil you can find, you can find uh, olive oil, you can find canola oil, you can find rapeseed oil, you can find peanut oil, if you're very fancy, maybe some cashew oil, avocado oil. Have you ever seen on the shelf pig fat oil? You ever see over there a uh, giraffe? I'm a giraffe kasha. Uh, maybe you find over there, uh, um, I don't know, rhinoceros oil. Maybe you find over there some elephant oil. It's, it's something that's not even shakhir. And that doesn't even exist in the market that we're using, that oil. Let's pretend now that everywhere you go, there's fat from the pigs. Okay, let's pretend. Shemen udvash, says Maran. Honey, oil and honey. Shel goyim, of non-Jews. Afapi shehem vushalim. Even though they cooked those things, mutarim. It's allowed. Why? Why? Maybe they're cooking the oil or the honey in a pot that before they made a pig inside of it. Why is it allowed? Because fat, uh, the, the meat, it makes the oil, it spoils it. It makes it taste bad. It spoils. The same thing with honey. Even if there was non-kasher meat inside of your honey or inside of your oil, it ruins the oil and the honey, and therefore it's pagum, and you're allowed to eat it. Let's pretend the reality, where there, is the, there are these things inside of your food. According to Maran, the Shulchan Aruch, you would not have to worry about honey and oil that came from goyim and the utensils they used for it before. It doesn't actually matter. Interesting question. What happens if there are... I don't know if you want to know this. When you buy honey, you know, the honey, it doesn't come from a factory. The honey comes from bees. I'm sure some people don't know that. But honey comes from bees. Bees are bugs. Yeah, bugs, they're not kasher. Today they make you wash your lettuce 14 times and to then look at it with light bulbs and all these things. Imagine if they heard that the honey comes from a bug. Imagine this reality. And if only you would know that in the barrels of honey, they even have the legs of the bees are inside. They fall off, they get stuck in the honey. Are bees' legs inside of the honey a problem? Shulchan Aruch says not a problem because they don't give flavor. You never ate honey and said, mm, that tastes like a bee's leg. So, it's not even a problem. Salted fish, lemon juice. Maran writes in source number 10. Tzir dagim, timeim, the brine of non-kasher fish. So you see, you, you 
pickle a fish, you put it in vinegar, I don't know, salt water, whatever you pickle the fish in, the juice of that fish, that's not kasher, a non-kasher fish, it's only prohibited according to the Chachamim. Not according to the Torah, according to the Chachamim. Lifichach, therefore, mutar liknot mehagoi dagim meluchim tehorim. You're allowed to buy salted fish from the goyim, the kosher fish, even if they're sitting together with a non-kasher fish, together in the same pot, in the same bowl, the same barrel, because maybe they were not salted together. I mean, if they were salted together, it could be a problem. But they were not, maybe they weren't salted together. But why maybe? Because it's only a rabbinic halakha. It's only a rabbinic prohibition. Sometimes you hear, oh, you can't buy this because maybe it was with something else, and maybe, but all of those maybes, who created them? Are those maybe all biblical prohibitions? Or are they just rabbinic prohibitions? How many of the things that people are afraid of them, how many of them are really biblical prohibitions that you have to take that far? If you look in the top of the next page, four, the Ramah mentions that Ashkenazim have a custom to be careful about certain things. Herring and the like. You know, the truth is, I don't know how much the Faradim are eating pickled fish today anyways, but uh, by the Ashkenazim, this is a much more relevant idea of pickled fish. And uh, Maran says, you don't have to worry about it. Lemon juice. Source 12. Mei limonish. Water of lemons. Shemvi'im hagoim v'chen chatichat dag maliach. They bring you uh, pickled lemons or pickled fish. They're kasher, but they're, they're pickled by the goyim. You're allowed to buy them. So. Now what happens? They're going to tell you maybe when they cut those lemons or they cut that fish or they cut with their knife that the flavor from the knife goes into the fish or goes into the lemon or goes into whatever they're cutting. And let's pretend right now you didn't learn with me the halachot yet of stainless steel and glass and metal. But let's pretend really that when you cut a lemon, the flavor of the, of the uh, bistik that they ate before with this knife, it goes now into the lemon and now it tastes like steak. Okay, let's pretend for a minute. Just pretend. Says the Ramah, why can you buy the lemons or the fish if they were cut by the goyim with their knives? Because they bring a lot of them together. And even if the first lemons became non-kasher because they were cut with non-kasher knives, they're all nullified in the later pieces of lemon. Because they all got mixed together, and they're all permitted, and everything that's similar to this is allowed. Let me explain to you this halakha in terms that might be relevant to you. I don't know what happened in Mexico a few years ago, but in America we had a big tragedy. The tragedy was that all the chocolate chips, the little pieces of chocolate that the people put in their cookies, all of them became halavi overnight. Nothing changed. The ingredients didn't change. There's no milk inside of them. But now instead of saying kasher parve, they say kasher halavi. Why? So the real reason, or the fake reason, the fake reason is, ah, because they're using the same equipment to make the chalavit chocolates, that they make the parve chocolates. And so the parve chocolates, they're chalavi because they were made on dairy equipment. That's what they tell people. Uh, I don't know about the, you, but in America, soy milk and almond milk and cashew milk and all the, all the milk made from nuts, most of them say chalavi because they're made on machinery of milk. The real reason, what happened is for the kashruyot, it's a good business. You see, when you send a mashgiach for a kashrut, you pay per hour. Maybe some kashruyot in the world, some of them charge $500 an hour for a mashgiach. It could be. Now the mashgiach, poor guy, he makes like 30 bucks an hour, not a lot of money. But the, the company makes good money. It used to be the company would tell, the agency would say, listen, when you finish the halavi chocolate, wash the machine like this, scrub it like that, and then the rest of them, you call them parve. A few years ago, they decided, why should we let them do it? We'll supervise the chocolate chip, the, the cleaning of the machine. Don't think the rabbi is going to clean the machine. It doesn't do anything. It just stands there. 
Let's let the rabbi watch the machine being clean. And then we'll write parve. The company says, how much is it going to cost me? So, well, every time you want to switch the equipment from chalavi to parve, you have to call us. The company says, what happens if I don't do it? So, so we're going to write kosher, but it's going to say chalavi. You think the non-Jewish company cares? Costco cares. Trader Joe's cares. They don't care. They say, fine, write chalavi. We don't care. Are those chocolate chips chalavi? Absolutely not. They're parve. Now, what happens? Someone called me, a rabbi. How could it be? How could you say such a thing? I was in the factory. I saw they don't even clean the machines. They go straight from chalavi directly to the parve machines. Let's pretend. Let's pretend that rabbis don't lie. Okay, let's pretend he wasn't lying to me. Let's pretend he actually saw a factory in his whole life. Let's pretend his story is true. The company that writes dairy-free, they write gluten-free, they write vegan, let's pretend that they want a lawsuit because they're going to lie to people that there's no dairy and they're going to die from dairy. Let's pretend that everybody here in the story is telling the truth. If the machine is chalavi and it has milk in the machine still, and chocolate chips start coming out that are parve. The first, I don't know, a thousand chocolate chips, 10,000 chocolate chips, you're right, they're chalavi. But they make three million chocolate chips in that machine that day. How much chalavi is in that machine that is going, all the chocolate chips became chalavi? The chalavi disappears at a certain point in time. And there's chametz in the machine. How much chametz is in that machine before there's no more chametz in the machine? And once that happens, everything is parve, it gets mixed together. The Rama says every case like this and everything similar to this is allowed. He says that's why the Ashkenazim, they buy the kruv, shikorim, compost. I don't know if I'm reading it right. You heard, I'm, when I think he's talking about a sauerkraut. You know what sauerkraut is? It's cabbage, they slice it very thin, they pickle it. Now if he would know that today they say you can't buy cabbage from Goyim because of the bugs, the Ramah would be very surprised. But let's pretend. Okay, let's pretend you can buy it, there are no bugs. He says, not a problem. It's not a problem because even though their knife is cutting, at a certain point the non-kasher runs out and the food is all kasher. So far, we've talked about ovens, dishwashers, meat and milk, trusting other Jews, We've been talking about uh, factories, pots, pans, pig fats, all of the things that until now you can see. I'm sure there are rabbis who teach their communities, but none of them have sources from the Shulchan Aruch. They directly, the Judaism that they're teaching directly contradicts that which is written in the Shulchan Aruch. It's very important to know that. That it's okay if you want to create your own religion. That's fine, you're allowed to do that. That's you and HaKadosh Baruch Hu going to talk about it. But you cannot create a religion in the name of the Torah, in the name of Halakha, in the name of Shulchan Aruch, sometimes even in the name of Sephardic Judaism. Uh, Shulchan Aruch, written by who? And now we have the next part, which is what if. What if is the mentality that, what if the factory had this? What if the store did that? What if the non-Jew? What if, uh, I'm buying, like I said, orange juice. What if the factory that makes orange juice also squeezes uh, pigs with the same equipment? That's a great question. What if? I mean, I can't imagine a reality where that would be true, but what if? What if they did that? Okay, okay. What if in the orange juice they put oranges that were cut with knives that were used to cut, let's keep going, were used to cut lasagna that was hot and it's chametz and, and, and then the oranges and the bread and what if? All of these what ifs. They make what if. And you can't buy it without a hechsher because maybe, and maybe, and maybe. So let's look, how did our poskim, how did our chachamim look at this type of Judaism? So one more example before we talk about the laws of Pesach. Maran writes in Shulchan Aruch, source 14. B'makom shenahagu heter bepad shel paltav, afilu hu nilosh bebeitzim, o shebeitzim tuchim al panav mutar. The story of buying bread from non-Jews, it's a long story. I have a shiur on YouTube, it's called Pat Shel Goim. Uh, bread of non-Jews, I taught it in the Chabura in London. You're welcome to look at that. It's not the topic of my conversation today. Knowing what we know, that all the Jews in the world, especially the Sephardim, we all bought bread from Goim, every single one of us. Unless your grandfather or grandmother were Mekubalim and they meditated on magic carpets, and aside from them, who didn't buy bread of Goim, all the rest of us bought bread from Goim. 
in Syria, in Morocco, in Lebanon, in Egypt, and you name it, Yemen, they went to the bakery and they brought pitot and they brought lafot and they bought lavash and they bought everything that they sold. That's what we bought. From who? From Ahmed and from his sister. That's where we bought our bread. That's how it was. You cannot create a reality. Now, in America, we had a problem about two years ago. One of the major bread companies decided they're not certifying their bread kasher anymore. And the, the Jews, they panicked. Like, like, they weren't panicking that the Gilad didn't happen yet. They didn't panic that maybe uh, half the Jews don't know the Torah. They panicked, what are we going to eat tomorrow? There's no bread. I felt like, was, was her name Mary Antoinette? You know, if you don't have bread, eat cake. Remember she said that to the people? I said, we're going to do what we did yesterday. Before, before there were kashrut, we ate bread from the goyim. Tomorrow, without a kashrut, we eat bread from the goyim also. It's not a problem. Ah, but what happens if the bread of the goyim has on the top of it eggs? Why would there be eggs on the bread? Can you tell me why? To like bread in the... Ah, very good. Um, I'm assuming there are no Moroccans here. The Moroccans, it comes time for Pesach, they put eggs inside of the, the bread. Somebody told me that. That's very creative, but it's not what I'm talking about. Uh, here, you take the, the brush... But I'm half Moroccan. I wasn't saying anything bad about Moroccan. You take the brush and you brush it on the eggs and then you smear it on top of the bread so that when you bake it, it looks shiny. You see people do this with the chalot for Shabbat. They do it with certain breads so it looks nice. Bread of goyim is allowed. But are the eggs they put on top of them, are they kasher eggs? Are, goyim are not allowed to cook eggs for us. So maybe it's a problem of bishulei goyim. Maybe the eggs have blood inside of it. So maybe it's a problem of that. All kinds of, we have to make problems, right? Albert Einstein once said, beware of everybody, anyone who has a problem for every solution. We have solutions. Some people, they like to find problems every day. But let's think about it like that. Maran says, you don't have to worry about the eggs in the bread or on the bread. It's mutal. How could it be mutal? Before I ask you how could it be mutal, look what the Ramah says in source 15. Ve'otan nilosh shekorin kichlech. Today, I think they call it kichl. Those cookies that the Ashkenazi meat, it's called kichol. I don't know if you ever saw kichol before. Kichol is like a, like a cookie, like a sugar cookie of sorts, a cracker. It's like a, if a cracker married a cookie, and then sometimes they put a salted fish on top of it. Omine mitika shikorin lekach. Lekach, I don't know if you know this either. I'm not an expert in Yiddish. I just, uh, I married a wife who is. Uh, lekach is honey cake, or really maybe any type of cake, but the honey cake that Ashkenazim eat before Rosh Hashanah, they call that lekach. Okay, so these baked goods, that are made by the goyim, hem bichlal pat, they're included in the category of bread, uvmakom shenohagim heter bepat shel goyim, gam hem mutarim. You're also allowed to eat them in places where you eat non-Jewish bread. Velo amrinan sheesh behem mishum bishulei goyim, we don't consider them to be a problem because they were cooked by non-Jews. They're not cooked, they're baked. Baked goods of goyim are allowed to be eaten. Look at the top of page 4 on the left. V'yesh mineni losh shekorin kichlech, there are some baked goods, she'ofin otam al barzelim, that they bake them on top of metal, I don't know if it's rods or racks, but they put it on, they cook them, on, they bake them on top of metal. Umoshchim ha-barzel b'sha'at afiya b'chelev or chazir, maybe it's chalav, I can't tell you. They smear it with non-kasher fat, pig fat, let's imagine. So can I eat the bread that comes from the rack with the non-kasher pig fat? Listen carefully. The Rama says the Ashkenazi custom, not a halakha. The Ashkenazi custom is not to eat those cakes. So the cake that you know for sure has pig fat in the bottom of it, it's better to be careful and not to eat that one. Meaning, there's room here in halakha to say that it's okay. But the custom of the Ashkenazim is not to eat it. Now, I don't want to get stuck on that. I just wanted to show you that I have a, a student, she came here a long time ago from Mexico City. She once sat in my class in the laws of Kashrut. And she's Ashkenazi, as Ashkenazi as it comes. Her father was a rabbi in Mexico, her grandfather studied in Slabodka. And she said, you know, when I hear you teach Halakha, it sounds like my grandfather's teaching. So I want to tell you the truth. My opinion is that Ashkenazi Jews are also normal. They once Ashkenazi Chachamim were, were very uh, uh, normal, full of common sense. I just don't have the freedom to speak in the name of Chachamim Ashkenaz. So instead, I choose to speak in the name of the Svaradim. But when you're reading these things, I'm sure so far what you've realized is that the Rama here is not so much in contradiction with Maran. That really, even the things that we disagree on would not create the type of culture 
around Kashrut that we see in the world right now. Now, the Shach, source 16. The Shach, Sifte Kohen, he's one of the major Ashkenazi commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch. He writes, what about the eggs that are in the bread or in the cake? He says, what could be the problem? He lists three problems. What's the problem? Problem number one. What if I'm afraid maybe there's blood inside of the eggs? Most eggs don't have blood. Because of that, like he says in Siman 66 in Shulchan Aruch, I'm sure you know that this is an argument between the Rambam and the Shulchan Aruch, but according to Maran Shulchan Aruch, the eggs that you buy in the store, not the ones that you get in your farm with the roosters, the egg in the store where the chickens, the hen, the female chicken, she never met a male rooster. Those eggs, you do not have to check them for blood at all. At all. That's Shulchan Aruch. Why? Because they don't have blood. But even if they have blood, it's not really blood according to Maran. Rambam says it's a scientific fact. It is blood. I'm not sticking my head there right now. But we know that if even those of you who check eggs, in my house, I don't check eggs. Maybe you'll have a problem eating in my house. But even in your house, if you check eggs and you buy 18 eggs, are the majority of the eggs in the container, they have blood? They don't have blood. Because of that, says the Shach, you don't have to worry that maybe the eggs in the bread have blood. It doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about that. Most eggs don't have blood. Maybe the egg they use is a non-kasher egg. Which animal has eggs that is not kasher? Pigs don't lay eggs yet. So, Ostrich. Okay, ostrich eggs. And mitzuim benenu. They're not very common to find ostrich eggs. If you go to the store, again to the grocery, the non-kasher one, which eggs can you buy? You can buy chicken eggs big, chicken eggs medium, chicken eggs small. If you go to a fancy place, maybe you can buy some quail eggs. They don't sell ostrich eggs. And if they did, they would be marketing it all over the package. Ostrich egg chala, ostrich egg uh, cookies. You don't have to worry that maybe the egg was not kasher. They're simply not commonly found among us. If you're worried about the eggs being cooked by goyim, are goyim allowed to make eggs for us? No. No. The halachot in the chapter 113 of Yuredea are that foods that you cannot eat them raw and that are served at a king's table, a non-Jew cannot cook them for us. It's very important. We want to be Sephardim, we have to follow the Shukhan Aruch. We can't have food cooked for us by goyim, certain foods. Eggs falls into that category. Kim ikar kachad poskim. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter, because there are more flour than there is eggs. Flour is allowed to be cooked for us by goyim, and the egg is therefore batel. It's nullified into the flour, and you don't have to worry when there's a mixture of something that is allowed to be cooked by goyim and not allowed to be cooked by goyim. You go based on what is the majority of that product, and what is the main part of that product, and the main thing is bread. Nobody thinks I'm eating eggs with flour. Yeah, that's something else. Uh, you know, when you eat in the morning uh, chilaquiles and you have tortillas and you put eggs on top of them, that's one thing. But if you're just eating bread that has eggs inside of it, nobody thinks I'm eating eggs. The ikar is the bread. You don't have to worry about it. This commentary in Shulchan Aruch could not have been written in the year 2023. Because if he would say, ah, don't worry about the blood. Ah, don't worry about the eggs. Ah, don't worry about the bishul goyim. They would say, ah, look at him, he's not a real rabbi. That's what they would say. I have a little bit of experience. This commentary could only be written a few hundred years ago in Ashkenaz, ironically. And so when you look around the world and the people tell you, you cannot buy this, and you cannot buy that, and what about this, and what if then, you have to say, hey, 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 slow down. I know that according to your religion, a person should live all their life with phobias of all kinds of pigs that are hiding and jumping into pots and all kinds of ostriches and elephants, I understand. But I follow halakha. I'm an observant Jew. I, I, you know that about me. And therefore, I follow what it says in the Shulchan Aruch. Now, everything I told you so far is true about Kashrut. And every class that I've ever taught about this topic, I've stopped in Source 16, and I summarized. But in this class, I was asked to teach about Pesach. And so I added Source 17 and 18. And I hope you give me, I know what time it is. Just give me a few more minutes. I want to finish the source sheet with you, uh, please. And I'm sorry that I, I asked forgiveness, that I'm holding you up a little bit. I want to explain to you that these halachot do not change when it comes to Pesach. It's very important to know this. Halakha does not change by Pesach. Chametz is a big deal. Of course Chametz is a big deal. But the general rules of Kashrut still apply during Pesach. Can someone tell me one rule 
that applies by Kashrut, but no longer applies on Pesach? Bitul. Bitul, very good. Bitul. So when pig falls into chicken soup, yes, it's batel bishishim, it's nullified in 60. But when chametz falls into kasher le Pesach food, Chachamim tell us, afilu be'elef lo batel. Even in 1,000, it's not nullified, right? We know this to be true, meaning even if it's one crumb of bread that falls into the chicken soup, that chicken soup, you're not allowed to eat it on Pesach. But there's a rule to that. There's, a, there's an exception to that rule, and it's very important that we read that rule. Let's look at it now. Source 17. Maran, Rabbi Yosef Karo, in the Shulchan Aruch, in the Bet Yosef. He says, based on everything he wrote, it's a very long piece of the Bet Yosef. Merkachot ha'asuim kodem ha'pesach. Foods, merkachot are cooked foods. Like jam is cooked, he was referring. But foods that are cooked before Pesach. Mutarim, they are permitted to us on Pesach. Ve'afilu bishlam bekelim shedarkan levashel bahem chametz. If you make food before Pesach, in your chametz pots and pans, they are kasher to be eaten on Pesach. Listen carefully and please don't shoot me before I'm done. If you make, let's say on uh, seder, let us seder, you're going to eat um, chicken soup with matzah balls. Okay, let's make a good food, uh, good Jewish food. Chicken soup with matzah balls, you're going to eat it. And you want to cook, you don't have a kasher de Pesach pot. You don't remember how to make your pot kasher de Pesach. So two days before Pesach, you're making the food, you make it in your chametz pot. Mama, chametz pot. Before there, you made chametz. You're allowed to eat that soup on Pesach. Huh? How could it be? Let's keep reading. V'chametz shnitarev kodem Pesach batel b'shishim. Because chametz is not nullified on Pesach. But before Pesach, are you allowed to eat chametz? Today, today is Tuesday. Are you allowed to eat chametz? Of course. So chametz today doesn't have to be nullified. Meaning if it falls into your food, it's already batel. Only on Pesach is the rule that when chametz falls into your food, even in a thousand it's not batel. And therefore all of these prepared foods, salted fish and cheese and cooked foods that were made with no special supervision for Pesach. And yes, they may have been made in chametz utensils. Are absolutely permissible to eat on Pesach because there's no problem here of afilu be'elef lo batel. Now it's true that for that shkana, it's true that for that. Yeah, very good. So we're we're going to actually read about that in just a moment. Um, but even if so, do we not say behetel of la? Exactly. So that Rabbi Chacham Shimon is telling you correct. Yeah, even if it's ben yomo, even if it's ben yomo, right before Pesach, I meaning if it's not ben yomo, it might not even be a problem in the first place. But before Pesach, you don't need any uh, thousand amount to nullify the chametz. And, but this is assuming that the pots really absorb flavors. And if you want to see my class on kelim and, and modern appliances, you can look also in my kashrut series on in, uh, YouTube. Uh, I have a whole series on that. Uh, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the, before Pesach, a person is able to cook in their chametz utensils. And the food is kasher le Pesach. Now, this, by the way, is a major difference between Sephardim and Ashkenazim. The Ashkenazim don't agree with this rule. And the real reason they don't agree with this rule is because of a concept called Choser Veneo. The truth is the Rambam seems to err on that side also. So, not err. It seems to lean to that side also. There's ways to read the Rambam, but for right now, according to the Ashkenazim, you're right, today, on Tuesday, the Chametz is nullified. But when you have it on Pesach, the Chametz jumps out of the food and jumps back inside. Choser Veneo. He wakes up again, and then now it falls into the food again, and then it makes all of the food chametz. I can't solve that difference. There are two completely different understandings of how chametz works in food. And when I hear Sephardim arguing with Ashkenazim, oh, we eat rice, oh, we don't eat rice, oh, you, you eat beans, I don't eat beans, I eat corn. All of that stuff is little children's play. The real fundamental difference for us is that any food that was prepared even in chametz utensils before Pesach is kasher le Pesach. And if you don't believe the Bet Yosef, look in the Shulchan Aruch, source 18. Chametz be Pesach. 
הלכה 1, אוסר את הערובתו בין במינו, בין שלא במינו, במשהו, אפילו בהנאה. When חמץ falls into food on פסח, even a crumb, it forbids the whole thing, you can't even sell it to someone non-Jewish. It simply, it becomes חמץ, it's forbidden. ב. חמץ שנתערב משש שעות עד הלילה, אינו אוסר במשהו, אלא דינו כשאר איסורין. Listen to this הלכה. After you are not allowed to eat chametz anymore on the eve of Pesach. So sometime in the morning, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, we stop eating chametz. From that time until Pesach, you're not allowed to eat chametz. The chametz, though, if it falls into your food then, is nullified in 60, like other Isurim. But it doesn't need anything more than that. Dalet. Im nitarev chametz kodem Pesach, v'nit batel b'shishim. If the food was nullified before Pesach, in 60, אינו חוזר וניאור בפסח, לאסור במשהו, it doesn't make a problem on פסח, ויש חולקים, there are those who disagree, when Maran says a halacha, and then he says, and some say that it's a problem, the opinion of Shulchan Aruch is always the first opinion, and not the second opinion. That's the rule of how Maran wrote his Shulchan Aruch. Unless Maran said, some say yes, some say no, then the opinion follows the second one. Here Maran is telling you, his opinion is, that the food is something, you're allowed to eat it. And therefore, בשר יבש, the last halacha, או גבינה ודגים שנמלכו קודם הפסח, ולא נזהרו בהם. Fish, meat, cheese, all of these prepared foods, meat that were prepared before פסח, ולא נזהרו. Nobody took careful uh, care to make sure there wasn't chametz there. So people ask, can I buy meat for פסח today? Or do I have to wait until they put up the white sign and they raise the prices uh, double so that I can buy my meat? Can I buy it now or can I buy I say it's a mitzvah to buy your meat for פסח before פורים. Why? Because after Purim, you won't be able to afford the meat anymore. Because they, they raise the prices on the meat. Ah, but maybe they weren't careful about chametz. Doesn't matter, says Maran. Mutar l'ochlam ba-Pesach. You can eat them on Pesach. Except for salt that was maybe soaked, uh, salted fish soaked with chametz, but you're not eating that food. <coughs> but the Ramah agrees. So for the Ashkenazim, the Ramah agrees that if you want to buy meat and eat it on Pesach, but you don't know that there wasn't chametz there, Ramah says you should wash the meat three times, and then even Ashkenazim can eat the meat that they bought before Pesach. So to summarize, the laws of chametz don't apply before Pesach. Today, Pesach, chametz is allowed to be eaten. <coughs> ah, but you're not allowed to intentionally nullify something, right? You're not allowed to levatel lechatechina. You can't say, ah, I'm going to put pig inside of my chicken soup, but I'll put only a little bit of pig inside of it. You're right. But now it's not Pesach. Now there is no prohibition of chamet. I have a letter on my forum online, a teshuvah that I wrote, that in general, bitul, when it comes to Pesach, once you come to buy a product, you're already not in a lechet situation. The bitul was already done before you came to the store to buy the product. And therefore, it's permissible to buy those food products in the first place. And so now that we're done the source sheet, let me summarize. Avodai Pesach is the holiday of freedom. It's the holiday where we left Egypt in order to receive the Torah on Har Sinai. The same Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to us is our gift, it's what makes us chosen from the nations. It's the same Torah that David HaMelech told us, Derecheha Dachei Noam, V'chol Netivoteha Shanom. Her ways are pleasant and peaceful. It's the same Torah that Chachamim told us makes our life freer. It makes our life easier. It cannot be that the holiday that we celebrate freedom, the holiday that we celebrate the preparation for receiving the Torah of freedom, makes us feel like slaves who are in a burden, who are being oppressed, who can't afford anything, who can't eat anything, who cannot buy anything. It is counterintuitive to everything that we know about this Yom Tov, everything we know about this holiday. But not only that, it's counter to every value that we have in the laws of Kashrut. And more than that, it goes contrary to everything that we know about how halakha works in the first place. I don't think that you can walk away with this packet and decide every single food in the world what you can eat. But I think you can walk away with this packet tonight, laying down to sleep and saying, wow, all of the things that I was afraid of, I can throw off my shoulders now. They're not fears. They're not genuine problems in halakha. There are genuine halakhic issues to be concerned about. But all of the stringencies, these, and not even, not even stringencies, the fabrications of certain individuals to make us only buy their food for Pesach, 
judge them favorably. It's a mitzvah to judge other people favorably. To judge them favorably that they're looking out for parnasah because the Jewish schools are very expensive and the trip to Israel for the bar mitzvah is very expensive and uh, I don't know, the earrings for uh, the holiday are very expensive and so they have to make enough money to be able to support their family. Okay, so then you're doing tzedakah. But aside from that, a Jewish person has to know Judaism. An observant Jew in halakha must know halakha. Halakha is not a scary thing to study. If studied correctly, it will be the thing that sets you free. And so, before I call it a night, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to this Bet Midrash. Thank you to all of you who are running it and participating in it. Thank you for giving me a safe place to come and be able to share a perspective on Kashrut that may not be the popular one, but I will argue is the original one. It is the traditional one. It is the one that our forefathers, our teachers, our rabbis, our chachamim of a generation that's not so long ago. They fought hard to keep it alive. And today it has been overcome, it has been erased. And I pray and I hope that like the name of this group, Ibn Sefarad, we should remember that Sefaradim, it's not about where we come from. Not everybody here has to come from Sefarad. But it's about where we want to see ourselves go. This Torah of our Chachamim is a Torah that is a light. It is a Torah that can guide us clearly into the future to not become fanatic and chaotic like all of the Jewish communities that we see around us. And I hope that as we absorb this light, we can become a lighthouse. And together, myself and my kila, and you and your kilos and your families can be a lighthouse to light up the world for all of our brothers and sisters, those who are Jewish and those who are in the world at large, that we can serve our purpose of bringing the light of freedom, of Torah, the karati deror l'chol ha'aretz, the Prophet says, one day I will pronounce freedom for the whole world. Bezat Hashem, this should be a small step in taking us in that direction. Thank you so much for learning with me. I'm going to turn off my recording now. You can continue recording all you need. But if anybody has any questions or comments, I'm here. I'm not rushing anywhere. Uh, if you need to go, please feel free to go. If there's something you usually do when you finish teaching, please, Esperanza, take over. Uh, but I'm here to answer and to be a resource if I can. Thank you so much for learning to out with me tonight.